Welcome everybody. Thank you for holding on. I know it's a bit of a late start, but we're thrilled to have you here to, for today's webinar. And as you know, it's going to be on packaging testing, specifically considering edge crush and carton crush testing. But before we dive in, there are a couple of housekeeping notes I'd like to share with you. Today's session is brought to you by McMason, a proud member of the Physical Properties Testers Group, or PPT for short. The PPT group is a collective of leading brands in the field of physical properties testing, offering a wide array of solutions for tensile testing and compressive strength, torque testing, textile testing, and the effects of shock and vibration, amongst other parameters. Our sister companies within the PPT family include Landsmont, James Heal, and Allures. But for more details about the group or any of the specific brands, please, you are welcome to visit the PPT website. Um, we've also shared a link to our events page in the chat box for your convenience, and you'll, you'll see it there. But just focusing on McMesson, we have established technology labs across the US, UK, and Asia dedicated to supporting our customers with education, proof of concept, and demonstration testing. Should you have any specific needs in physical properties testing, our global team is at your disposal to provide the assistance that you may need. But let me introduce the team for today's webinar. Moses DeRocha will be our presenter, and I'm Sharon Smorenberg, one of the coordinators behind the scenes. So additionally, we have support staff and partners stationed across Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas, ensuring that no matter where you are, we have a local expert that can support you. As always, we're aiming for a dynamic and engaging webinar. Therefore, we encourage your participation through questions. Feel free to submit any questions you have at any point during the webinar using the questions box. We will then address these during the Q&A session at the end. As always, the webinar is being recorded and we will send you a copy of the recording to your inbox in the next day or so. But without much further ado, I'll hand it over to Moses. Well, thank you, Sharon, and uh, thanks everybody for making the time to join our webinar today. Our previous webinar was more of an introduction to packaging testing, uh, focusing on top load testing, edge crush testing, and uh, cotton crush testing. Uh, the objective today is to take a closer look at two of those test applications, mainly edge crush testing, or you may know it more uh, popularly as ECT, and also box or carton crush testing CCT or BCT. Uh, so uh, real quick, our agenda for today will be uh, a quick overview of packaging testing in general. Uh, we'll take a look at what's involved in both of those testing applications, edge crush testing, box or carton crush testing. And then we'll also delve into what goes into selecting the ideal tester and fixtures for both of these testing applications after which we will uh, perform a live demonstration of what those two tests actually look like in real time. And then uh, we'll also discuss uh, some of the factors that affect repeatability and consistency in any testing environment. And it's gonna be a discussion that pretty much covers any physical testing application, but will pretty much apply it to these two testing applications uh, that have been listed here, ECT, BCT, CCT. All right, so, Packaging testing is important uh, for research and development to determine product viability, the strengths and weaknesses of products, or for quality control uh, in establishing product standards for quality and safety, uh, and also on the production floor for maintaining product quality and safety standards, and also in cases where uh, in the supplier audits, uh, the verification of those same product qualities and st uh, safety standards are required, uh, those testing applications may be implemented. Now, you'll find packaging testing in almost every industry, uh, in automotive, aerospace, medical, pharmaceutical, paper and plastics, cosmetics, food, beverage, in manufacturing, electrical, 
And for purposes of this particular webinar and for these two testing applications, most of the tests we'll be discussing will mainly be compression testing. And so generally compression testing will provide data on the integrity and safety of materials, components, and products. And it could be either finished products or raw material. And it generally involves applying a uniaxial force to measure the performance of a test specimen under compressive load up to the point of yielding or failing or breaking. Uh, the sample under test, as I mentioned, may be a specimen of raw material or an actual finished product. And you'll find this in all of the industries that we previously mentioned. They could be plastics, they could be metal, they could be paper, they could be cardboard, and so on. And uh, test samples are usually compressed with a compression plate or a probe, and the load is applied at a constant rate of speed. And the data collected can be plotted on a graph showing either a force versus extension in a force test or a stress versus strain curve in a materials test. Uh, generally, compression testing is performed with plates, probes, and fixtures, and the tests may be either destructive or non-destructive. There are three main primary test applications in compression testing. Uh, regardless of the type of material you're testing, the first procedure involves running at a constant rate of speed and compressing the sample to a known deflection or displacement, and then calculating the peak or maximum force applied when the sample is compressed to that displacement or deflection. The second procedure involves very similarly running at a constant rate of speed and then applying a known compressive force to the sample and also then calculating the peak deflection. So for instance, if you applied 20 pounds to a sample, how much does it actually deflect? Does it fail? Does it hold its form? How much does it deflect? And then finally, that, that third procedure involves running at a constant rate of speed until the sample fails, breaks, buckles, or it, when it reaches its actual deformation point. And then at that point, you can calculate both the force and or deflection at the point of failure. So these are the three major tests that you usually find in a typical package in compressive testing. And you can do one or all of the above, depending on exactly what data you're looking for. And most testing standards, whether ASTM or ISO, will also fall under one or more of these test samples. All right, so packaging testing, as far as edge crush testing or ECT, and it's popularly known. It is essentially just a measurement of the edgewise compressive strength of corrugated board. Uh, since the edges and corners of a box are mostly responsible for bearing the load, the test captures material strength. The test is measured by compressing a predefined piece of corrugated cardboard on its edge between two rigid platens, which is an upper platen and a lower platen. This compression test is performed perpendicularly to the direction of the flutes until the board collapses, and at that point, a peak load is reached. Force is reported as a force per unit width, which is the width of the sample. Uh, if reported as an ECT value, uh, the minimum value corresponds to pounds per inch width. So that is all there is to the mystery of edge crush testing. Cut a small piece of cardboard, put it between an upper and lower plate, apply a constant rate of speed, compress it either to failure or to a known uh, deflection. Uh, if you're testing it to conform to ISO 3037, uh, there are specifications on the what the samples should actually look like, the test specimens, what the test speed should look like, and uh, how far you need to compress it to. Now, most testing standards are used more as a guide than anything, so you'll find a different industries uh, subscribing to different approaches in testing these, but they'll all look similar, as in conforming to one of the three main compression test uh, approaches we've previously discussed. So today's test is gonna kind of loosely conform to ISO uh, 3037, uh, but as I mentioned previously, if your test requirements are different, uh, it's not gonna change much in the setup and the approach as far as the sample uh, size, the uh, fixtures that are used and the tester and so on, which we will discuss hopefully in the live demonstration. Now choosing the ideal tester. 
uh, there are different types of testers that can indeed approach this particular test depending on what the actual test calculations require. If it's a very simple run to a crash and just measuring a peak force, then a simple motorized force tester can do the job with a force gauge that measures the actual compressive force. You mount the gauge to the tester, get your fixtures on the bottom, you cut out your samples, run to touch, crush, and then back off and measure the peak load. That's simple. However, if you're looking to test um, strictly to a specific ASTM or ISO standard, there may be additional calculations in there that the simple standalone motorized testers may not be able to perform. In those cases, a software-driven force tester is more ideal uh, because it takes the guesswork out of the operation where all the calculations are performed automatically. So we're not asking our, you know, our operators to put on their math hats to actually perform the calculations manually. And we, you know, not to mention the kinds of errors that could creep into those calculations if the wrong formula is used and so on. So in this demo, we will be using software-driven testers to kind of capture the ease of use and the accuracy and consistency and repeatability of the test. All right. Having selected the ideal testers, the next step is to select the ideal fixtures. So in edge crush testing, uh, you'll find, uh, again, depending on whether you're testing to an ASTM or an ISO standard or an in-house standard, your own custom standard, you'll encounter a few things. One is the guide blocks that actually hold or the stabilizing blocks that hold the sample. You'll need an upper compression plate. You'll need a lower platen to make sure the sample is sitting flat on the uh, base. And there may be other more creative uh, uh, fixtures depending on your test approach. If you're looking at that third image there in my slide, this is where you're actually testing the edges on the actual assembled box. Those will call for kind of a uh, inverted chisel type fixture to accommodate the edges uh, and also prevent any kind of slippage. So again, as I mentioned, it could be an actual test to a existing standard, a custom test, or more creative one, as you see in that third image. We will see these uh, in a little bit more detail when we get to the actual live demonstration. So your test fixtures can be different sizes and materials, obviously, whether it's aluminum or steel, uh, whether it's a six inches or uh, 12 inches and so on, all of that obviously depends on the size of the sample you're testing. These can also be round platens, they can be square, they can be rectangular to conform to the type of sample you're testing. And then those base stabilizing blocks that are more in accordance uh, with the standard than anything. And also sometimes a base a plate with a slot to make sure the sample does not fall or move uh, while you're testing. We'll look at both of those here momentarily. So that's all there is essentially in the uh, ECT uh, as far as selecting the ideal tester and the ideal testing fixtures. Cotton crush is very similar. Again, it is the measurement of the compressive strength of corrugated cartons and boxes. And the cotton crush or box crush test, BCT, is commonly used to assess the effect of applying an axial top load force upon the flat size of a carton box to simulate the stacking uh, in a warehouse. So the process of storage or transportation from point A to point B, do you stack them 10 high, especially when they're actually filled with product. So imagine a beverage company that's stacking 20 ounce bottles, you know, 12 in each carton. Do you stack them 10 high? Do you stack them five high, 15 high? How much force can that lowest, lowest box on the bottom actually accommodate without buckling and creating all kinds of liability issues, spillage, if it's chemicals or just wastage, if it's you know products that you're looking to actually send to market to sell. So uh, that's important. We need to know what those values are, as in how much uh, axial force or a top load force can that carton actually accommodate before it fails. Again, any of the three compressive tests we've looked at can be simulated for this particular application, as in if we compressed it to say a quarter of an inch, a half inch, one inch, how much force, top load force are we going to encounter or is it going to fail? Or if we apply 200 pounds of force to this, which would simulate a 10 high stacking, would that bottom uh, bond with the sample fail? 
If not, great. If, if it did not fail, how much did it deflect or did it even deflect at all under that load of 200 pounds? And then there are instances where you're going to test a sample until it fails just to see how much it deflected and exactly what force at which it actually failed. So those are all uh, are possible in this particular test application. The test is measured by compressing the sample across its entire surface area. Uh, there are other uh, testing applications for cartons and boxes that might re uh, require either uh, probes that will puncture or, or deform it in a different way. For this particular application, you need a compression platen, whether it's round or square or rectangular, that covers the entire uh, uh, surface area of whichever sample you're testing. Again, this may be destructive or non-destructive, depending on whatever your own internal test requirements are. Once again, the ideal tester uh, can be, uh, again, on this, especially in instances where you're looking to test all three, used all three approaches, um, we recommend the software-driven tester. Makes it very easy for you. And uh, when we, once we get to the fixtures, you see some of the approaches we have used. And the advantage here is, you're also able to accommodate small boxes all the way up to really large boxes. Whether you're using uh, a single column unit, a dual column unit, or a more dedicated uh, cotton crush tester, which is our Squeezer Pro. So our sister company has that and it's dedicated specifically for larger boxes. Uh, so these are all the different types of testers we would recommend for the uh, carton crush or the box crush test. Ideal fixtures are going to be either just freestanding compression platens, round, square, or rectangular for smaller boxes. Or for larger boxes, you can have those uh, compression platens, the rectangular with the guided rods to kind of ease the load on the sensor that's actually applying the force. In the case of our Squeezer Pro, all of that is built in all the above. So you have the guided plates, you have the sensors uh, actually on the bottom that measure the compressive force. So we uh, all, all of the above are pretty much available. The different sizes and materials, they could be aluminum. Uh, there are in, in cases where we've tested uh, samples that are conductive, so we ended up using Delrin that's possible. These can be, as we've mentioned, round, square, rectangular. And then there are also instances where if you had uh, uh, samples with uneven surfaces, you could use self-leveling plates to ensure that uh, it, the, the compression plate actually sits flat on the sample at all times. So the static one is just static and then there are also self-leveling options and as i mentioned previously though the plates can be either freestanding or they could use guided rods so without further ado i will be activating my camera here and also activating the software so we can kind of quickly walk through the two applications we have just discussed so if you bear with me All right, so very quickly, um, this is the setup we currently have for the box crush test. Uh, again, for purposes of the save, uh, this, the area, the, the space we have in my testing area, we had to use a single column and uh, four by four by six boxes, just again, same concept, just slightly smaller containers or samples, uh, just so we can still capture the essence of the testing application. So all we're using here, so essentially this is the Omni Test 5, and we're using a um, an extended base plate and also a larger 13 inch round compression plate. Again, the key here is to cover that entire surface area of the box that we'll look in the test. So other than the tester, which we wouldn't be going into at this time, all of the action happens in the testing software. So again, once a test is configured in our flagship Vector Pro software, all the operator has to do is go in, select the appropriate test, put a sample in, hit that start button and start testing. So I am going to quickly go over what the test configuration looks like again. So this is the box crush test. And in this test, we have additional notes on 
the test name, the type of load cell to use, obviously an image of whichever sample you're testing, and you can browse your, your computer for whichever preferred image you have, especially in instances where you have different sizes of containers or boxes, uh, you could uh, uh, browse for the appropriate image. The next thing is the operation, which essentially determine, determines what the test looks like. Again, whether you're configuring a general uh, ISO test or ASTM test, all of those are going to be on this operations screen. So we'll start on the right side. This is where you select your sampling rate. We currently have it set to 50 samples per second. Again, that's user selectable anywhere from one hertz up to a thousand samples per second. And your preferred units of measurement can be newtons, kilonewtons, ounces of force, pounds of force, and so on. For purposes of our demo, we'll be using uh, newtons. Your displacement units can be microns, millimeters, inches, and so on. And then your speed units, inches per minute, microns per minute, millimeters per minute. And then you also have some stress and strain values. Because the software is compatible with different types of applications, all of those will be there if and when you need them. So the commands we have used here, here are all the different commands that are used in the test procedure. And each of them will have a little tooltip that indicates exactly what those commands represent. And uh, all you do as an operator is just drag and drop as many different uh, of those commands into the timeline to essentially determine what the test is actually looking to do. So this is start by zeroing, run to touch, run to um, 25 millimeter, which is just about an inch compression, and then return home, which allows the operator to remove the tested sample and then place a new sample. So in this test application, we're using compression test procedure one, which is essentially running to a known deflection or known displacement and then measuring the maximum force. There are instances, as discussed, where you can apply a known force and then measure the deflection, but that's not gonna be part of our uh, live demonstration today. And then finally, in the test results, we are looking to simply measure the maximum force, which is once you compress this to an inch deflection, what is the maximum force? And there are also instances where you can capture the, the average force, you can capture different types of calculations, what's the slope, if you wanna get a little bit more fancy. So, all of those are available calculations in your standard calculations, the area under the curve, which is energy, the slope, uh, if you wanted to find an average, even if you wanted to calculate the value of a specific force at a known deflection. So yes, we're compressing this to about an inch or 25 millimeters. If we wanted to find out the force at 10 millimeters, we could use that value command to capture that data and so on. And then last but not least, that's our temp report template selection. So all of our reports can be generated using any one of the following templates. So this is what typically your graph would look like. Again, this is just a generic uh, preview, uh, but you can enter your own uh, report name. You can select your logo. If you're testing for a particular customer, you can put your own logo in and so on and so forth. And so once all of that is done, that is essentially your test configuration file. Again could be an ISO standard, could be an ASTM standard, could be your own in-house standard. But when an operator logs in, the first thing they do is select the tester they're looking to use. So I'm going to just change the contrast a little bit so we can see the traces better. At this point, we're just gonna set a home position, uh, which will allow the crosshead to return to that home position at the end of each test and um, just push start. So it's gonna come down, it's gonna to touch the top of the sample and then it's gonna to compress to 25 millimeters. It's gonna record that peak force back off to the home position. And then we'll put another sample in and run that as well. I'm gonna run just two samples and then we can do kind of a uh, comparison. Okay, so here's our crush. Okay. 
So there are also break detections in there. So if you are running the third procedure where you're running to failure, you wouldn't have to go all the way. You can ask the test to stop when it sees the, for instance, that peak load drop by a certain percentage, could be 10%, could be 25%. So it's not gonna go all the way to the target displacement. As soon as the sample fails, it's gonna immediately stop the test. So now the test has completed. If we go into results, so if you click on that, it will tell you that the peak before the sample starts failing is about 1200 Newtons. Uh, which is a little over 240 pounds thereabout. So that's the force that I require. That's how much pretty much that it can actually withstand before it starts failing. So at this point, I'm going to remove the tested sample. Actually put this in there just so we can do a nice little comparison between the two. So these are, oh, I apologize. That was me. I have no idea. I think I might have. Okay, there we go. All right, we'll exit, go back to the graph and start. So once again, it's going to run to touch. I'm going to compress. So these are totally different boxes by to, uh, two different manufacturers. So we just get to compare and see. So the red trace you're looking at. Is the uh, second test. Ah, look at that. Uh -huh. All right, test complete. All right, once the test completes, we'll go into the test results. So the first one was about 1200 Newtons, that second one seen about 1600 Newtons. So if you're in the business of uh, performing a comparative analysis between your different samples, this is one quick way to tell uh, what's going on. You'll see a live graphical representation of what the tests look like overlaid. And so again, there's some annotations so we can just say this is the brown or well, cardboard for that matter. But And then this is the color. All right. And then just based on that, if you had to generate you can export there are uh, different exporting options for exporting to excel exporting to a csv file exporting either the raw data and or just the test results or you can just essentially just uh, create your test report based on the template we selected so that's a sample one sample two and you'll have a graphical representation with the key or the legend that tells you exactly which color represents which sample on the graph. There are inbuilt PDF drivers to allow you to just essentially PDF uh, this particular test report. Finally, there are also pass or fail criteria that could be applied if you turn on your verification, if you want it to meet, say, a minimum of 1,000. Now, these usually are set at the time of configuring the, the test. So I've just generically put in a minimum of 1,000 Newtons, maximum of 1,400 Newtons. And once you exit, clearly you can see that 1,200 falls within your range for pass or fail. And then that 1,600, because it fall, goes above that max, is showing a fail. Now these results will show up as soon as the test complete in real time. So if you had to determine pass or fail, uh, you would either set that up at the time of configuring the test, or you can do so after the fact by applying your actual uh, minimum and maximum uh, pass or fail criteria in the test. So that is essentially the test. So moving on to test number two, which is our ECT. Once again, as you can see here, this is based on ISO 3037. 
Um, the interface is going to look very similar to what we did previously with slightly different calculations. So again, you see a few more. There is a, we've included a pause or a message to the operator to remove the guiding blocks once the upper plate has actually made contact with the uh, sample and stabilized it. We just slide them back and then continue the test and allow it to compress. We're only compressing to about 10 millimeters uh, at the stated rate of uh, 12.5 plus or minus 2.5 millimeters per minute. Once that test is complete, it's going to return home. Uh, in the test results, there are some additional calculations uh, that are required in the test standard ISO 3037, which we've been able to use our little formula calculation here to build. Uh, if you look into that, it's going to take that max, multiply it by 0 0.01 uh, to come up as a, I believe this is a kilonewton per meter. Yeah, so that essentially that is. And, uh, report template already selected. So that is the test. And I am going to move over here just to set up a sample. Just a second. I'm also going to kind of move the uh, camera a little bit to that test setup. So these are the scored samples. These will go in here and we'll slide that to hold the cardboard in place. And we'll go in. And once again, we're gonna change the contrast a little bit. Once again, we're gonna set a home position because this is slightly different position and click start. So it's gonna come down, apply that preload and then uh, we'll get the prompt to re um, slide the guide blocks back. And then we're going to check the continue. And continue. So that's going to proceed. All right, test complete. Let me run a second test here. That's what the deformed sample looks like. I'm gonna throw another one in here. Fixture it. And then simply click start to start the second test. Once that completes, we'll look at both test results and I kind of get an idea of what they both look like. Okay. All right, completes the test. All right, so we have samples one and two. So the max, max on that initial one, maximum force, about 336 Newtons. Second one was about 282 Newtons. And that is the formula we had according to the standard. So once again, this is a very simple test. 
And as I mentioned, if you're testing to a standard, great. If you're looking to perform your own in-house standard where you say, you know what, apply 10 pounds of force to this corner and let's see exactly how much it deflects, you could do that. Or run until the sample fails, stop the test, measure the deflection at failure, and also the force applied at failure, you could do that as well. But this is essentially uh, what the typical ECT is all about. Um, once again, this is what your test report looks like. All right, so all that said, establishing consistency and repeatability in your testing. Uh, now that usually involves a few factors. The first, obviously, is to define the testing objective. Why are you even testing the sample in the first place? Now, I know we talk about it. We beat this like a dead horse every single webinar, but you'll be amazed. A lot of our support issues will cover one of the above areas, whether a test objective has not been properly defined. Once you define that testing objective, all right, we, we want to see the strength. We'll know uh, or quantify the uh, compressive strength of our cartons that's an objective in this particular test. Once you've done that, you now need to establish your testing standard. And that can be an in-house standard where you determine to use one of the three uh, previously discussed approaches to compressive testing. Or if you're testing specifically to an ASTM standard, or in this case, ISO or ISO 3037, like we just discussed previously, you need to then establish that as what this is how we're going to test this particular product going forward. So there's no deviation. And then next, just as important, is to determine the appropriate testing equipment. If this is a simple operation, we can get by with a simple motorized tester and, you know, force gauge, that's it. If you need to perform additional calculations, more like the ones that are usually stipulated in any testing standard, then you need a little bit something a little bit more sophisticated so your operators are not guessing what the results are. Uh, and then obviously in uh, combination with the appropriate testing equipment is also the ideal grips and fixtures. And then obviously develop an SOP for operators and staff. So this is one of those uh, testing applications that will require that approach, especially in ECT. All the samples need to be cut cleanly according to ECT. If you're using ISO 3037, it asks for 100 millimeter wide by 25 millimeters uh, uh, length and they all need to be same product, cut to the same size. There are dies, are die cutters out there that will cut those exact uh, uh, sample coupons for you to test. Or if you want to create your own coupons in-house, then you need to develop a standard of operation where, hey, we're testing in this environment, so the samples are not too rigid to when it's too cold or too soggy, if it's too hot, maintain a certain uh, testing environment where everyone's doing the exact same thing at the uh, same time. Uh, and that's uh, one of the uh, SOPs that you could develop for operators and staff. And then obviously, once you, uh, if you're after you've checked all of these boxes, you're still getting inconsistencies in the data. It's obviously important to check the actual product anomalies to make sure there are no issues on the production line that's causing uh, the uh, inconsistencies in the test results. So these are all the different important factors that go into establishing a consistent and repeatable testing environment. Now, I'd be remiss if I did not mention uh, another approach to uh, testing cartons and boxes, which is the drop test. Uh, again, this simulates a real world uh, uh, scenario where, you know, from the production floor, through transportation, through storage, when it gets to the final destination, uh, if uh, a staff member dropped one of these boxes, what is likely going to happen either to the box or to the contents within that box. So our sister company, Lansmont, has an upcoming webinar for drop testing. This is gonna be on August 7th at 11 a.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. GMT. And essentially, these drop, we're looking closely at drop testers, uh, which are used to expose packages and packaged products to a range of impact energies. Uh, the higher you drop an object, the greater the impact energy. Uh, they'll test for free-fall drop test systems that take advantage of acceleration due to gravity, 
which is constant and repeatable. Again, dropping items multiple times from the same height should result in the same impact velocities every time. Uh, within a testing environment, the repeatability is desired as it eliminates or minimizes variability in subsequent test results. So this is another test that's important in this industry. Uh, it would be excellent if you could uh, you know, sign up for this webinar as well. Uh, my colleague Sharon is going to provide the link to register for this upcoming webinar in the chat. And with that, we have come to the Q&A part of our webinar. And I will turn it over to Sharon. Thanks so much, Moses. We actually have quite a few questions already. Oh, cool. So <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me start with the first one. Sure. What statistical sampling sizes are needed for the testing? Um, this is going to vary. Um, from industry to industry, uh, you know, and from organization to organization, even regardless of which test standard you're using, there are some that will specifically say, you know, test eight and then calculate the average of eight. But unless otherwise specified, uh, this will depend on the actual industry. In my own experience, I usually test 10 samples. You take the first 10, and you look for your percentages. If eight of them are meeting your standards, you're a very happy person. If just two of them are meeting, so it's an 80-20 kind of relationship. If only two are meeting the standards, then hey, we need to go back, check all the factors that are affecting your consistency in testing. But this is gonna vary unless otherwise specified by the testing standard. All right, back to you, Sharon. Thanks, Moses. Um, the next one is, what are the statistical feature for the test results? So, um, besides capturing the actual calculations, as I mentioned, whether, uh, again, I hope I'm understanding the question appropriately, uh, measuring for uh, peak load, average load, the selected calculations that are in there, uh, value at a known deflection, value of a deflection at a known force and so on. They're also the ability to export the raw data to Excel to perform additional statistical calculations on uh, standard deviation and so on. So that is all available within the software. And so, if again, if you're looking to really dive into the data, so imagine if you're capturing data for your 10 tests, the sample uh, uh, tests, and you're testing at 100 hertz, and each test takes about you know 30 seconds to complete. That's about 3,000 data points for each sample that you can actually export to Excel and then manipulate as you see fit to kind of. Uh, uh, explore additional calculations to get more, even more data um, uh, in order to get to know your samples better. So back to you, Sharon. Next question. Did you say this is a free floating or fixed platen on the tester? I like free floating. Please discuss the difference between the two <laughs> platen type results. Okay. So when I mentioned free floating, let me bring um, so in the initial setup for our box crash test, when I said free floating, it only simply refers to the fact that the upper and lower platens are not connected with guide rods. So I, I, yeah, the terms kind of is a little confusing, understandably, but they're both static as in the base is attached permanently to the base of the tester and the upper is attached permanently to, well, semi-permanently, unless you remove it for a different application, attached to the load cell. So they're not free floating per se, but only in terms of not being connected using the guide rod. So you've seen some of the uh, fixtures pre uh, referenced previously, the rectangular that are joined in four corners with uh, guide rods. So it kind of slides up and down uh, so, because sometimes what happens, especially with larger cartons, is to just leave that attached to the load cell, you might have it either leaning one way or the other, but those guide rods ensure that they sit perpendicular and this, you know, they don't waver or move either laterally or, you know, tilt uh, while you run the test. So, that's essentially the main difference between free, you know, floating or static and also the uh, ones that use the guide rods. Back to you, Sharon. Thanks. And now this question, Moses, I don't know if um, how fully you can answer this because it does sure. relate to Lansmont, but okay. we can always, you know, 
send a send an email from Eric's side once sure. um, you know a, a more complete answer, but I'll I'll pass it along anyway. Sure. Um, it's is the software compatible with all Landsmont compression testers, the big testers? If yes, how can we upgrade our old software? That's an excellent question, and this comes up quite a bit. So, as far as I know, the software we just demonstrated is currently only compatible with the Squeezer Pro from Landsmont. Uh, unfortunately, I can't speak to the other pieces of equipment or what a roadmap is, if any. Uh, I'm sure my colleagues at Landsmont could probably answer that a little bit more intelligently than I can. But currently, as far as I know, only the Squeezer Pro uses the Vector Pro software, uh, which we just demonstrated. Thanks, Moses. And no problem. yes, again, if you guys are unsure and you want to reach out to Landsmont directly or even just reply to the email that you've received um, for this webinar, then I can always pass the question on to them and, and if you need any further clarification on that. Then the next question is about the FACER substance. Do we need to also key that into the system? I don't know if I'm... Um, it's not 100%. Yeah, I hope that makes okay. sense. Can you, uh, can you repeat that for me, Sharon? Yes. So I, I don't know if it's... It's, it's not written correctly, but it's um, about the FACER substance. We need to key in also in the system, right? Question mark. If, if, if it, it depends, it depends. Now, there are, so everything we've just done today is essentially force testing. There are materials testing applications. And if you can still see my screen here, I will quickly show you what that looks like in, for instance, in this edge crush test. There is, so if you look at the specimen tab, this will allow you to enter the actual cross-sectional area of the sample. I've seen certain testers out there that require you to enter it. The testing standard that does not require it. If you're looking to enter it, there is a place to do that in our software. And that's only granted you're looking to use these values entered in additional calculations, things like a compressive modulus, uh, offset yield, and so on. But other than that, you know, we just stick to a simple uh, force testing application. So when you're entering specimen name to calculate your cross-sectional area, which is using additional calculations, we've kind of transcended the force testing and gone into materials testing a little bit. So yes, there is an area to enter that uh, the box information. So again, as you see here, you can select the type of sample you're testing. Is it square, rectangular? Is it solid? Is it hollow? And so on. And so, yeah. The, the the answer is yes, you can, uh, if that is a requirement of your particular uh, uh, testing application. Thanks, Moses. We've got another no question. Um, how do you address the challenges of testing irregular or flexible packages with compression testing? Um, so that's where, and it's it's all going to come down to fixturing. The key to fixturing is making sure the sample is not moving around or prematurely deforming a, a while it's under compressive load. So in cases of irregularly shaped samples, those are times when we recommend a self-leveling compression plate. So those actually move to conform to a certain uh, flat surface on the sample, even if it's irregularly shaped. And again, Depending on how sensitive the sample is or how uh, uh, thin the sample is, we have options for either Delrin plastic or aluminum or stainless steel or hardened steel if you're not looking to exert too much compressive force on the sample. So we have all kinds of different options to make sure um, that the uh, sample stays stable, even if they're irregularly shaped in the testing application. But it's all going to come down to fixtures. If there's nothing off the shelf, uh, there's also capabilities for coming up with custom fixturing uh, to make sure uh, we accomplish that same goal of making sure the sample is not moving around during compressive testing. Back Thanks, to you, Moses. I think no that is the, the last of the questions. Again, a reminder that 
If you feel that you have any questions after this, feel free to reach out to us directly. There are some emails on the screen right now that you can that you can use. And then I just wanted to remind you that our next packaging webinar is taking place on August 28th. And this will focus on peel and adhesion strength testing. So we really hope to see you there. It will again include some demonstrations and um, I have placed a link in the chat box for you to register with if you are interested in that or if you know anybody that would be interested in that. Thank you so much for joining us today and we hope that you found it informative. Um, and there's yet another question. Wait. <laughs> no, <laughs> Sorry. <sure. laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> How do you ensure the accuracy and repeatability of compression test results? Um, again, this is going to boil down to the accuracy of the load cell. So we recommend annual calibrations of the load cell. Now, again, that's also dependent on the uh, frequency of use. We do our recommended uh, intervals are one year, starting one year from the date of first use. But we also have end users that use them so much, they want to maintain that accuracy. So they'll calibrate every three months, every six months, and so on. That's the first part. There is also the second part of measuring the accuracy of the, the ball screw itself and the potentiometers in the uh, the actual vertical uh, displacement. So those can be verified and adjusted as necessary um, to maintain, again, accurate machines will yield accurate results, right? So yeah, those are the two ways of maintaining that. Now, again, that final part of the factors that contribute to consistent and repeatable tests means that if all of the above is okay, and you're still getting inconsistent results, there might be instances where the something is actually happening on the production line that's creating those instances, uh, the inconsistencies. So it might also be a good idea to take a second look. I know that's always a, such a resistance to that. So oh, we've been using these machines for 40 years and they're always good. But here's a case where we have a test standard, we have an SOP, we have all the correct equipment and fixtures. And we're running these tests with calibrated systems, calibrated load cells, but we're still seeing inconsistencies that can only come from the actual product. All right, back to you, Sharon. Wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, Moses. <laughs> no problem. Appreciate that. But that concludes the webinar for us today. Uh, we hope to see you guys again for our next webinar and I hope that you have a good day. Thank you, Moses. Thanks, Sharon. And no problem. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to end the webinar. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Cheers. Bye.